title of this talk is From Sabbath to Lord's Day, and my aim in this uh, address is to convince you about the perpetuity of the Sabbath, uh, but with a difference. Okay, we're going to read two Bible passages, and, and then I'll speak. As we come to God's Word, let me pray for us. Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So Genesis chapter 2, uh, verses 1 to 3. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. And if you turn also to Exodus chapter 20, Exodus chapter 20 and verses 8 to 11. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. In his book, Genesis in Space and Time, Francis Schaeffer makes this comment. History is the warp and woof of space and time. The fabric of history is the interweaving of space and time. That is no more true than when it comes to the opening prologue of the Christian Scriptures, Genesis 1-1 to 2-3. In the prologue, we are presented with created space, the heavens and the earth, and also ordered time, the seven-day week which climaxes in the Sabbath. This is what makes for history, according to Schaeffer, the warp and woof of God's created time and of created space and ordered time. When these two realities interweave, when they intersect, we get history. We get the history of the world, which means that if we want to understand the history of the world, we really need to understand the space and the time that God created. In particular, we need to understand His holy space and His holy Sabbath, because the history of the world not only begins with the heavens and the earth in relation to the Sabbath, it continues with holy bounded space in Eden and then Canaan in relation to the Sabbath, and it consummates with the new heavens and the new earth in relation to the Sabbath. Biblical history is really the warp and woof of holy space and holy time. We might even say that it is the interweaving of God's space and God's Sabbath. Now, for our purposes this afternoon, I'm going to focus in on God's Sabbath as an integral component of the unfolding history of the world. And in true Reformed fashion, I'm going to do it under five points. So number one, uh, the Sabbath is protological. The Sabbath is protological. What I mean is the Sabbath belongs to the things that God first made in the beginning. Protology is the study of origins, the study of first things. And the Genesis prologue gives us two protological realities that God made in the beginning, space and time. He first made protological space. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. First, He made the heavens. You'll notice that it's plural, which means there's more than one of them. 
If you cast your eyes down, chapter 1, verse 8, you'll see that God creates an expanse between the waters below and the waters above, which He calls heaven. The expanse, rakia in the Hebrew, is where the sun and moon are placed in verse 14. So we might call these the sunny, starry heavens or the space heavens, the ethereal heavens. These are the regions beyond this earth, what today we would call space or outer space. Then in chapter 1, verse 20, we have another reference to this expanse of the heavens. It is what the birds are said to fly across. Now, we, don't, we, we know birds don't fly up in space where the sun and moon exist. Uh, they fly in the sky, which must mean a lower region of the expanse of the heavens. We might call these heavens the sky heavens, the airy heavens. I think this is the best description because in verse 26 and 28, they're called uh, the birds of the heavens. And by heavens, it can't mean outer space where the sun and the moon are, since we know birds don't fly up there. Uh, so it's got to be the lower regions. So these heavens seem to be distinguished from the space heavens. So we have the sky heavens and the space heavens, two heavens that are the natural heavens that God created in the beginning. But Scripture also speaks of the supernatural heavens where God Himself dwells. Isaiah 66 verse 1, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. That heaven is neither the natural sky heaven or the natural space heaven. It is rather the supernatural, supreme heaven where God dwells on His throne. Now, we should be clear that this heaven, this supernatural, supreme heaven, is not eternal. It has not always existed. Before the beginning, God did not live in heaven. He did not live in this heaven. Before the beginning, there was no heaven. There was only God, which means that this heaven must have been created. And Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 6 affirms this. You are the Lord, you alone, you have made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their hosts, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them, and you preserve all of them, and the host of heaven worships you. So clearly there's a third kind of heaven other than the sky heaven, other than the space heaven which God made in the beginning. I'm calling it the supreme heaven, the Empyrean heaven. In Second Chronicles 6, 18, Solomon refers to it as the highest heaven. In 1 Kings 8, 31, he calls it the heaven of heavens. This is where God dwells. This is where He is worshipped by the heavenly host. So to sum up, with regard to Genesis 1-1, the heavens that God creates in the, beginning, in the beginning are at least three heavens. The sky heavens that the birds fly across, the space heavens that the sun and the moon are placed in, and then the supreme heavens where God dwells on His throne and is worshipped by the host of heaven. In the beginning, God created the heavens. He also created the earth, one earth. And just like the heavens, God made distinct spaces on the earth. He formed the expanse of the heavens just above the earth by separating the waters below from the waters above. This is the sky, which we've just mentioned. It's the lower regions of the expanse of heaven. It is spoken of in relation to the earth. Then he formed the seas by gathering the waters together and allowing the dry land to appear. So God created spaces on earth, matching the spaces in heaven, we might say. He created sky, sea, and land. We might even say that the sky is the overlapping connection point between the heavens and the earth, since it relates to both. And so this is how history begins with a holy God dwelling in His holy space, 
History begins with God seated on His throne in heaven with the earth as His footstool, being worshipped by angels above and creatures below. And history continues with this same protological space, the sky heavens, the space heavens, and the supreme heavens. They all still exist today, just as they did at the beginning of creation. It's the same heavens that He made in the beginning, and it's still the same earth that remains as His footstool. Nothing has changed. And because nothing has changed, this is why we sing on the Lord's Day, God is in His temple, the Almighty Father, round His footstool, let us gather. So that's the protological space that God made in the beginning, which remains the same today. But in the beginning, God also made time. He made protological time. In the beginning, God created and established time. We see this by the time markers that are effused throughout the Genesis prologue. There's the beginning of time, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Then there are the boundaries of time, verses 4 to 5. God creates daytime and nighttime. The light He calls day and the darkness He calls night. Two time boundaries. God also sets the bookends of these boundaries of time, evening and morning. The phrase is repeated six times for each of the six, first six days of creation. Uh, the phrase could be a way of bookending the main periods of the day. There, and there was evening, ends the period of daytime. And there was morning, ends the period of nighttime. Or the phrase could be a way of marking a day from the beginning of the day to the end of the day. The Jews began their days in the evening, and there was evening, and their day continued in the morning, and there was morning. I think the latter interpretation is best since it reflects the order of time under the Jewish calendar for the first age of the world. But whatever view we take on, and there was evening and there was morning, we see the rhythm of time sounding all the way through chapter 1. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day, and there was evening, and there was morning the second day. Then there are the markers of time, verses 14 to 18. The sun and the moon are placed in the expanse of the heavens, not just to give light, but do you notice, verse 14, to mark time. In fact, that's the dominant pur purpose in verses 14 to 18, to mark time. The primary purpose of the sun and moon is not to give light, but to separate day and night, two time references, to mark signs and seasons, days and years, more time references. Then there are the registers of time throughout the chapter. First day, second day, third day. These are ordinal numbers, not cardinal numbers. The days are labeled first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh in the Hebrew. They're not labeled day one, day two, day three, day four, five, six, seven, as if they are simply literary constructs that can be moved around and matched with each other. Meredith Klein tries to do this with his literary framework hypothesis, but as a result, basically, in my humble opinion, ends up mangling the text. He dechronologizes a highly chronological text. He changes the ordinal numbers into cardinal numbers. And then he tries to match the days of creation by a forming, filling scheme. You've probably heard it. I think it's probably the most popular way to describe Genesis 1 in simple terms. On days 1 to 3, God forms realms. On days 4 to 6, He fills those realms. And then what Klein does is he tries to match the days. Day 1 and day 4 match. Day 2 and day 5. Day 3 and day 6. But when you take a closer look 
uh, you see that it doesn't actually work. Like for a start, uh, God made forms the light on day one. And remember, day four must fill what is formed on day one. But we would never talk of the sun and the moon filling light. We would talk of light filling the sun and the moon. It's the other way around. In fact, Moses says that the sun and the moon on day four fill the expanse of the heavens, which are made on day two, not day one. The birds on day five don't actually fill the sky, which is made on day two. They are commanded to multiply on the earth. So now they're filling what was made on day one and day three. And then there's the vegetation on day three that begins to fill the land formed on day three. So Klein's attempt to match the days in a forming, filling scheme doesn't really hold up uh, to close scrutiny. Now, I, I like Klein. He's very uh, creative. Sometimes when you read him, you think he's on to something. Uh, other times when you read him, you think he's on something. Uh, and I think when it came to Genesis, he was smoking a bit of wacky backy or something. Because it doesn't really hold up uh, to close exegesis. I think it's better to stick to the text as it comes to us and apply that great biblical principle that what God has made ordinal, let man not make cardinal. Uh, what we have in Genesis 1, 1 to 2, 3 are seven consecutive registers of time. They're built into a Hebrew narrative structure that is inherently chronological. Not only do you have the seven ordinal numbers, first, second, third, etc., but the Hebrew verb forms are vav consecutive imperfects by Yichtols, 55 of them, in an unbroken chain from Genesis 1-3 to 2-3. There's simply no other way to read the narrative than as a chronological description, a consecutive description of God's creation week. And this matters because of the final time marker, chapter 2, verse 1 to 3, the Sabbath. The creation week climaxes with the Sabbath. It's the day God ceases from His work to rest. The day is mentioned three times in the first three verses of chapter 2. God's actions in this week climax with Him making the seventh day special. He blesses it. He sanctifies it, something He doesn't do with any of the other days of creation. So, as we can see from these six observations, Genesis 1, 1 to 2, 3 is all about time. In the beginning, God created protological time as well as protological space. Genesis 1, 1 to 2, 3 presents the beginning of history as a holy God in His holy space of the heavens and the earth being worshipped by angels above and creatures below as he brings his creation toward his holy time of Sabbath rest. This is how the history of the world begins. This is the warp and woof of space and time, as Genesis presents it to us. But what time are we talking about? What are these days of creation? And more to our subject, what is this Sabbath day? Are they real days or figurative days? Are they historical days or analogical days? Are they literal days or literary days? Well, the Westminster Divines, countering Augustine's view of instantaneous time, argued that God created the world, quote, in the space of six days. The phrase actually can be traced back through Calvin to the early church father Archelaus, bishop of Kaskar, in 278 AD. It's also used by Lantankius in the 3rd and 4th century. So the divines, by using that phrase, were not just continuing Calvin's interpretation, they were continuing the traditional interpretation of the early church. 
If you do the research, you will find very, very few exceptions to the literal interpretation of the days of creation all the way through church history. And in the light of the evidence, this is really the best way to interpret the days of Genesis. When the Hebrew word day, yom, is marked by an ordinal number and is accompanied by a day-framing, book-ending phrase like evening and morning, it's hard to interpret the day as anything else than an ordinary day. Now, I could make a whole lot more arguments than that, but this is one that the Hebraists on the conservative side, on the liberal side, and on the higher critical scholarship side all agree with. They all agree there's no other way to read the days of creation when it's marked by an ordinal number and is accompanied by the boundaries of evening and morning. And a plain reading of Exodus 20, which we read at the beginning, clearly supports this interpretation. Because how else would an Israelite from the second millennium B.C. interpret Moses' words at Sinai about God making the world in six days and resting on the seventh day? But if someone still wishes to hold to, the, uh, to one of the alternative views on the days of creation, here's the challenge. Every alternative interpretation of the days of creation cannot give an account for the ontological origination of the ordinary day or the ordinary week or the ordinary Sabbath. Let me say that again. Every alternative interpretation of the days of creation cannot give an account for the ontological origination of the ordinary day, the ordinary week, or the ordinary Sabbath. Now, here's the problem with that. From Genesis 2 onwards, the text of Scripture assumes the ordinary day, the ordinary week, the ordinary Sabbath. If ordinary days did not begin at creation in Genesis 1, 1 to 2, 3, then when did they begin? The genealogy in Genesis 5 speaks of the days of Adam after he fathered Seth. And then gives his age in years. Years are made up of days. So ordinary days must be in existence in Adam's lifetime. But when did they begin, if not at the beginning? If the ordinary days did not begin in Genesis 1, then they just pop up in biblical history out of nowhere. And yet it is essential to how Genesis and the rest of the Bible speaks of time periods in the life history of key people or events. For example, there are set periods of days related to the flood, seven days, 40 days, 150 days. When were these days established as ordinary days, if not at the beginning of creation? The same goes for the ordinary week. If the ordinary week did not begin at creation, when did it begin? The first reference to seven days occurs in the flood, when Noah is waiting for the floodwaters to come, and then again after the flood, when he sends out the dove. On two occasions, he waits seven days for the dove to return. There are other references to seven days in Genesis. Laban pursues Jacob for seven days when he flees from him. Joseph laments for his father Jacob seven days. The seven-day period recurs in Exodus 12 concerning the Passover. Israel is to eat unleavened bread for seven days. Every alternative interpretation of the seven-day week of Genesis cannot give an account for the ontological origination of the ordinary week. It just pops up in biblical history out of nowhere. The same could be said about the Sabbath. If the Sabbath day in Genesis 2, 1 to 3 is not an ordinary seventh day in an ordinary week, but some sort of eternal day, then the question is, when was the first ordinary Sabbath day? When did it begin? The first reference to the Sabbath after Genesis is Exodus 16, where Moses commands that Israel gather uh, manna for six days, but not on the seventh day. And Moses gives the explanation, which is a Sabbath. Now, this was pre-Sinai. They hadn't got the Ten Commandments yet, and yet Israel clearly have an understanding of the ordinary Sabbath day. 
Now, if the ordinary Sabbath was not created as protological time in protological space in the week of creation, then the question is, when was the Sabbath day created as an ontological reality in the life cycle or time cycle of history? Every alternative interpretation of the seven-day week of Genesis cannot provide an account for the ontological origination of the ordinary Sabbath. It just pops up in biblical history out of nowhere. Now, of course, if one holds to the literal interpretation, which was the dominant interpretation of the church before the Enlightenment, then the answer to these questions about the ordinary day, ordinary week, ordinary Sabbath is simple. They received their ontological origination by God in the beginning. And isn't that what Exodus 20, verse 11 to, uh, 8 to 11 states? Israel are to remember the Sabbath, which presupposes its pre-existence. They are to keep it holy. Why? Because that's the day on which God himself rested. He worked for six days and then rested on the Sabbath. The analogy in Exodus 20 is not between the days. As if you have divine days of God's work week in creation and human days of Israel's work week in Canaan. The analogy is not between the days. The analogy is between the workers. God worked for six ordinary days and rested on the Sabbath. Man is to work for six ordinary days and rest on the Sabbath. They are the same days, but different workers. And the human worker is to image the divine worker. So to sum up this first point, in the beginning, God made protological space and time. The protological space he made was real and literal, the heavens and the earth, which remain the same to this day. The protological time he made was real and literal, the ordinary day, the ordinary week, the ordinary Sabbath as a climax of that week. And just as protological space has remained the same, so too protological time has remained the same. I mean, don't we all still live in a seven-day week? Ordinary days, ordinary weeks. Jesus affirms as much when he says the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. He was stating an enduring principle for the history of mankind, for the whole history of mankind. So that's our first point. It's the longest one you'll be pleased to hear, but that's our first point. The Sabbath is protological. Now, the reason I've spent so long on this first point is because soteriology maps onto protology. Soteriology maps onto protology. So here's the second point. The Sabbath is redemptive historical. The Sabbath is protological, and second, it is redemptive historical. The protological space and time created by God at the beginning becomes the physical and temporal framework in which redemption unfolds in history. So we're back to Schaeffer's comment. History is the warp and woof of space and time. And this is especially so when it comes to redemptive history. God's plan of redemption plays out within the theater of the heavens and the earth as created protological space. And it plays out within the created protological timeline of the weekly rhythm of the seven-day week with the Sabbath as the last day of the week. Let me show you what I mean. Let's take soteriology and protological space, for example. Soteriology and protological space. After Adam falls, God does not abandon the created heavens and earth in his redemptive plan. He operates within it. God the Son comes down from heaven, as the Nicene Creed affirms, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven. That is, he comes down from the created space of the heaven of heavens that God made in the beginning to be his dwelling place. 
the space in which angels worship God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Son of God came down from that space into our space, into this earth. And He became incarnate in a virgin's womb. He then lives on earth for 33 years. He walks on dry land. He sails on the seas of Galilee. He even walks on the waters. Near the end of his life, he goes into a garden to pray as death casts its dark shadow over him. And then he hangs on a cross. Think about the space suspended between the heavens and the earth. After he dies, he goes into a tomb in the earth, into the belly of the earth, like Jonah in the belly of the fish. He goes down into Sheol, the, lotus, the lowest part of the earth. The flood waters of judgment pass over him. Then after three days, he rises again from the dead and he appears in a garden, being mistook for the gardener. And then after 40 days on earth, he ascends into heaven. He goes through the sky heavens, through the space heavens where the sun and the moon are, and into the third heavens, the supreme heavens, into the presence of God and His heavenly host. And there He sits down on a throne, and He is still seated on that throne in that holy space of the supreme heavens. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. They are the theater in which redemption plays out. And right now, Christ is seated in those heavens, and the earth is his footstool. The drama of soteriology is mapped onto and played out in the protological space of the original space of the heavens and the earth. This is why we need to believe what Genesis says. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Soteriology only makes sense in light of protology. Now, this is the same with regard to soteriology and protological time. Soteriology and protological time. Three examples here. Just think about the sign of circumcision with Abraham and his descendants. It is to be placed on covenant boys on the eighth day. What is the eighth day? It is one day after the Sabbath. It is the first day of a new week. It symbolizes a new beginning. But the symbolism of the eighth day only makes sense. It only works because of the fixed order of a seven-day week. Or think about the saving work of Christ, how it plays out in relation to the ordinary week. Jesus dies on a Friday afternoon at 3 o'clock at the time of the evening sacrifice. He dies, interestingly, on the same day of the week on which Adam was created, a Friday. He dies at the end of a working week. He sleeps through the Sabbath in his death and burial. And then he rises to new life on the eighth day, the first day of a new week, symbolizing a new beginning. The symbolism only makes sense on the fixed order of a seven-day week with the Sabbath as the last day of the week. Third, think about the significance of Pentecost. Pentecost occurs 50 days after the Passover Sabbath. That is, the Passover was on a uh, Thursday night, Friday, and then the Sabbath was the day after Pentecost occurred 50 days from that Sabbath. Now, if you can remember your times tables, 7 times 7, uh, 49. Paul Levy's got his phone out at the moment, just trying to <laughs> stick that in. 7 times 7, 49, plus 1, 50. So what day does Pentecost occur on? A Sunday, first day of the week. But the symbolism of Pentecost occurring 50 days after the Passover Sabbath it only makes sense on the scheme of an ordinary week with the Sabbath as the last day of the week. The drama of soteriology plays out in lockstep with protological time of the seven-day week with the Sabbath 
as its climax. In this sense, the Sabbath is redemptive historical. The Sabbath frames and structures redemptive history. So, we've seen two things so far about the Sabbath, protological and redemptive historical. Third, the Sabbath is typological. The Sabbath is typological. Not only is it protological, but it is also typological. The Sabbath points beyond itself to another reality. We get the hint of this in the way the seventh day is spoken of in chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. I wonder if you notice what was missing in those verses describing the Sabbath. There was no evening and morning. In this way, it points symbolically and typologically to a day that never ends. The Sabbath serves as a type of the rest to come, the rest of the eternal day in a new creation. The day in this sense was a sign of what lay beyond this life. The Sabbath was symbolic of the eternal blessedness that Adam could earn in the covenant of works. Through his obedience in the covenant of works, Adam was meant to bring himself and his posterity into eschatological rest of which the Sabbath was a sign. I like to say that Genesis 1 and 2 can be summarized as God's kingdom in his new creation under his son and bride awaiting a Sabbath rest. That is the end of day six. God's kingdom in a new creation under his son and bride awaiting a Sabbath rest. But Adam never brought us into that eschatological rest of which the day was a type. Instead, he brought unrest, not rest. Instead of blessedness in the presence of God, he brought curse and restlessness away from the presence of God. And the rest of the Bible is about man's pursuit of that Sabbath rest. And as such, the weekly Sabbath serves as a weekly reminder to man of what he ought to be focused on, the blessed eternal rest in God's presence. Now, in saying that this Sabbath in Genesis 2, 1 to 3 is typological, we mustn't make a hermeneutical misstep here, which those who advocate the literary framework and also the analogical position, I think, make. Some people, like those who propose the analogical view, argue that since there are no time boundaries, such as evening and morning attached to the seventh day here, this must mean that the day itself is not an ordinary day. Rather, it's an eternal day. It's God's Sabbath, so it has to be eternal, since God rests on it and He doesn't return to work on Sunday morning. But the absence of the time boundaries shouldn't be overplayed. They are absent to show us that the working week for God has come to an end. But not that the Sabbath day itself is eternal. That's a, that's a non sequitur. It's a bit like the person, if I could try this illustration, but it's a bit like the person who works their whole life in a particular job and then 40 years later on one particular Friday, they finish work for the last time. That weekend, they enter retirement. It is a very different weekend for them. They never return to work after it. In one sense, it's not a weekend for them, is it? Even though it is the weekend for the rest of the workers. We might say their weekend never ends from that weekend on. But for all their colleagues, Monday rolled around just like it always did, and they all went back to work. Well, it's the same with God. On the first Sabbath day, which was an ordinary day, God entered into His rest on that day. He has never returned to work, but the next week rolled around for Adam and Eve. Sunday rolled around as the first day of the next week, but God was in retirement, so to speak. Gerhardus Voss puts it simply and clearly. He says, although God's Sabbath is certainly endless, that cannot be said of the first Sabbath after the six-day creation for mankind. In fact, in order for the Sabbath to be a type, in order for it to be typological 
of the eternal Sabbath, which all scholars agree that it is at some level. In order for it to be a type, to be typological, it must first be historical. In terms of biblical theology, for a person, place, event, or time to function as a type of something in the future, the person, place, event, or time must be historical. In other words, the Sabbath's historicity is a sine qua non for its typology. Now, if someone argues that this first Sabbath is not a real ordinary day in history, we're back to that same question that I asked earlier. If this Sabbath day was not the first ordinary Sabbath day in history, then when was the first ordinary Sabbath day in history which serves as a type of the eschatological Sabbath to come? In terms of biblical history, in terms of redemptive history, the Sabbath day is far too significant for it just to pop up in Exodus 16 out of nowhere as the first ordinary Sabbath day. It had to exist historically somewhere. And the question is, where was its ontological origination? So, this is the third point. The Sabbath day is typological, and in order to be typological, it had to be historical. Number four, the Sabbath is eschatological. The Sabbath is eschatological. If the Sabbath day is typological, then it's eschatological. That is, it relates to an advanced quality of existence in the future that has not yet arrived in history. The clearest text for this is Hebrews chapter 4, uh, verses 8 to 12. You might wish to turn there. Hebrews 4, verses 8 to 10, sorry. The writer to the Hebrews says, For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So then, there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God, for whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works, as God did from his. You can see there that the writer of Hebrews makes it clear that there yet remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God, which means that the typological has not yet become the eschatological. And if this is so, then the typological remains. And if the typological remains, then the Sabbath remains, because the Sabbath is the type, which raises the question of the perpetuity of the Sabbath. Is the Sabbath still operative today? Is it still a protological reality functioning as a type of an eschatological reality? And if so, are we to observe the Sabbath today? Answer, yes, but. Okay, yes, but. And in order to answer the yes part, I'm going to go back to two of my earlier points, and then we'll come to the fifth point for the but part. Yes, we're to observe the Sabbath today because the Sabbath is protological. In the beginning, God made protological space and time, and neither has changed. Neither has changed. We are still living in the exact same universe with the heavens and the earth that God made in the beginning, and we're still living in the exact same time cycle of a seven-day week, which was established at the beginning of creation. In this sense, the Sabbath remains. So yes, we are to observe the Sabbath. It is a creational ordinance, not a ceremonial ordinance. Moses said, remember, remember the Sabbath. And then he pointed us back to the creation of the world and the first Sabbath. He did not point us back to the creation of the tabernacle and the Sabbath laws that were connected with the tabernacle. He pointed us back to creation. In other words, the law of the Sabbath precedes the law of Israel, the ceremonial law. Now, granted, within the theocracy of Israel, the Sabbath took on a certain ceremonial garb in a particular culture, for a particular time, in a particular nation, but it was not itself a ceremonial ordinance. It was, from the very beginning, a creation ordinance. 
So yes, we are to observe the Sabbath because it is protological. We're also to observe the Sabbath because it is still typological and not yet eschatological. As we saw from Hebrews chapter 4, the Sabbath serves as a type of a reality yet to come. But as Hebrews 4 tells us, that reality has not yet come. There yet remains a Sabbath for the people of God. The type of the Sabbath then cannot be obsolete when the reality of the Sabbath has not yet fully arrived. Hebrews 4, 9 to 10 is clear. There yet remains a Sabbath for the people of God, and therefore there yet remains a type of that Sabbath. And if the type remains, then so too does its observance. So yes, we are to observe the Sabbath because it is protological and because it is still typological and not yet eschatological. Which brings us to the fifth and final point. Yes, we are to observe the Sabbath, but it has changed. And it has changed because, number five, the Sabbath is Christological. The Sabbath is Christological. Now, this connects back to the second point, the Sabbath is redemptive historical. Uh, But what I mean here is not simply that the Sabbath points to Christ or is fulfilled in Christ, both of which are true. Jesus did say, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Jesus is the Sabbath rest that God's people were looking for. So yes, the Sabbath points to Christ and is fulfilled in Christ. But I think we would be overly simplistic if we left it at that. Yes, Christ fulfills the Sabbath, But that doesn't mean that the type becomes obsolete. Rather, it undergoes a change. The sign of the Sabbath has been replaced with a new sign. The Sabbath has been replaced with the Lord's Day. The last day of the week has become the first day of the week. Now, this change in sign is seen with circumcision and the Passover, As an Old Testament sign, circumcision pointed to Christ, Colossians 2, 12 to 13. But the sign did not become obsolete when Christ fulfilled it. Rather, it underwent a change. It was replaced with a new sign, the sign of baptism. Same with the Passover. As a sign, it pointed to Christ and His death on the cross as our Passover lamb. But what did Jesus do with the Passover meal? He didn't say, this is done now, we don't need to keep eating together. No, he inaugurated the Lord's Supper. It replaced the Passover meal. Well, so too with the Sabbath. It pointed to Christ who brings the eschatological rest, but when Christ fulfilled that initially in his first coming, the type did not become obsolete. He simply changed it and replaced it with a new type, the Lord's Day. So the Sabbath is Christological in the sense that Christ fulfilled it, but also in the sense that it underwent a change in the light of Christ's work. The day changes from the last day of the week to the first day of the week. I note the day does not change to become every day of the week. To say as much is to exhibit an over-realized eschatology. We must respect the now not yet tension between Christ's first coming and his second coming, between him fulfilling the Sabbath initially and fulfilling the Sabbath ultimately. The day changes, not to every day of the week, but to the first day of the week. When will the Sabbath be every day of the week? In the new heavens and the new earth. But that is not yet. And here we should consider again the redemptive historical aspect of the Sabbath in relation to Christ's death and resurrection. Recall how I said Jesus dies on a Friday afternoon at the end of a working week. He then sleeps through the Sabbath in his death. And then he rises again on a Sunday morning, the first day of a new week. The day in which he brings eschatological rest through his resurrection in its initial form. The day he brings eschatological rest is not a Saturday. It's not the Sabbath. 
He brings eschatological rest to His people initially on a Sunday, the first day of the week. Or as the biblical writers, the gospel writers like to call it, literally in the Greek, one day from the Sabbath. So when you're reading in your English Bibles, the first day of the week, it is literally in the Greek, one day removed from the Sabbath. Listen to the gospel writers and notice how they talk about the resurrection in relation to time references, in relation to protological time. Matthew, now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, literally one day removed from the Sabbath, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. Mark, when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, bought spices so they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, literally very early on one day removed from the Sabbath, when the sun had risen, protological space, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. Luke, it was the day of preparation and the Sabbath was beginning. The women who had come with him from Galilee followed and saw the tomb and how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and ointments. On the Sabbath, they rested according to the commandment. But on the first day of the week, literally, on one day removed from the Sabbath, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. John, on the first day of the week, on one day removed from the Sabbath, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. When you have the protological time glasses on, those little passing comments about the Sabbath after the Sabbath, when the Sabbath had passed, you realize that they are theologically loaded terms. They are theological shorthand for saying that when the old age of the world was setting and the new age of the world was dawning, I mean, no wonder there was an earthquake at Christ's death and another one at His resurrection. The old order of the heavens and the earth was giving birth to the new order of the new heavens and the new earth in the person and work of Christ. By rising from the dead on the first day of a new week, Jesus left the Sabbath in the grave. He retired the old order of time under the old dispensation in which the Sabbath was the last day of the week. And in its place, by rising on the first day of a new week, He inaugurated a new order of time under a new dispensation in which the Sabbath was now the first day of the week, the Lord's day. Here's how the Westminster divines explain it in the Westminster Shorter Catechism. Question 59. Which day of the seven has God appointed to be the weekly Sabbath? Answer, from the beginning of the world to the resurrection of Christ, God appointed the seventh day of the week to be the weekly Sabbath, and the first day of the week ever since to continue to the end of the world, which is the Christian Sabbath. This is the but part of observing the Sabbath today. Are we to observe the Sabbath today? Yes, but no longer on a Saturday, under the old dispensation, but now on a Sunday, under the new dispensation. Why? Because the Sabbath is Christological. It finds its fulfillment in Christ, the great harbinger of rest. And precisely because it does, it undergoes a change, a fundamental change from Sabbath to Lord's Day. And isn't that what we see in the time cycle of the New Testament church? Remember Pentecost, the inauguration of the New Testament church? When does it occur? Fifty days after the Passover Sabbath. 
It occurs on the first day of a new week. It occurs on the Lord's Day. In Acts, Christians are said to meet on the first day of the week. In Revelation, John receives his vision on the Lord's Day. This is the new structure, the new world order, because the Sabbath is Christological. The Sabbath is now the Lord's Day. So, we've seen five things. The Sabbath is protological, redemptive historical, typological, eschatological, and Christological. In closing, I want to return to that quote by Francis Schaeffer. History is the warp and woof of space and time. The fabric of history is the interweaving of space and time. When we understand what history actually is, the warp and woof of space and time, then we will understand how historically significant our weekly worship is. When we gather each Lord's Day as God's people in a bounded space on earth around His footstool, we are making history. And we are telling our secular culture that one day world history will be church history. I would have told you that was a quote from my brother, but given his introduction of me at the beginning, I'll leave it anonymous. (laughs) One day world history will be church history. And they, the secular world, should stop rebelling and should get on the right side of history. So this Lord's Day, as we gather together in a building, wherever it is, or outside, may we appreciate afresh that we are participating in a historical moment in history. A history that will one day become recognized as the only history that was worth making. Let us pray. Father, may you please uh, reform us and your church to love again the structure and the significance of the Christian Sabbath, the Lord's Day. And as we experience it each Lord's Day, gathered with your people, worshiping you, joining the church triumphant in heaven, may you please refocus our pursuit of that eternal blessed rest in the celestial city above. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.